Hmm, I'm bored. Let's read a book. <gasps> the early morning gray and white puffs of cloud were darkening and thickening as Gerlach bore me onto the worn but even gray stones leading to the city gate. The walls were scarcely impressive, rising only about twenty cubits. Two squarish towers, each with serenulated parpets, too small to be very useful, frame the gate. Graying and iron-bound timbers comprised the city gate itself, a gate that waited in a recess in the walls behind the towers. A stone bridge spanned the space between the towers. When closed, the gate sat on a stone groove and was backed with stone on all sides, making it difficult, if not impossible, to batter down. But any attacker would have gone for a less defended point on the low walls in any case. Set toward the city from the walls was a stone hut, and outside the hut waited a pair of guards. As I watched, a small cart, pulled by a sway-backed horse that could have even been a mate to the one I had seen at Felshar's, rocked over the stone gate groove and onto the pavement by the guard hut. The rear guard waved the cart, driven by a woman with straggly hair and a hooked nose, toward the other side of the roadway. Over there, don't take the whole road. Str the long reins clacked, and the cart lurched slightly away from us. Halt! The other guard stopped, looking bored, as he took in my dark cloak and the pony. Where'd you get that horse, boy? Felshar's officer. There was no sense in being nasty to the man. Besides, he was bigger than me. And if, Ponchi, probably could use that sword that one on hand rested upon. Any way to prove that? I shrugged. I have a bill of sale with Felshar's chop. Then I touched the staff, which was faintly warm to my ungloved fingertips. And besides, why would I lie about it? His eyes moved to the staff, winded like circles his eyes had widened, then moved to my face. You're young for that. I know. They've been telling me that since the spring. I unfolded the thin parchment from my belt. If you'd care to look. The look on his face, that, and the fury behind his eyes warned me. Clang! Thwacked! Whist! Thief. Somehow I had managed to stuff the parchment into my belt and grab the staff from the holder quickly enough to knock aside his sword, even before he positioned himself. The second tap, and it was scarcely more than that, was to his cheek. But the brand was instantaneous. Garlock didn't wait for my heels in his flank, but began to trot, then gallop through the still open gate. The gates couldn't be closed. Not in the instance Garlock took me to pass the second guard and through the gate gap in the wall. Cloppity cloppity clop. Garlock's hooves rang on the stones, and I dropped the reins and grabbed his mane with my right hand, trying to keep from hitting anyone with the staff, hanging on as we careened down the causeway. Look out! Runaway horse! Thief! Traitor! A set of paddlers scrambled off the causeway into the mud-filled trench on the right, and Garlock angled around a slow-moving wagon pulled by a single plonic horse which barely lifted its head. I could have reached out and touched the dusty harness so close to be pass. The traffic on the causeway probably saved us from an arrow in the back, but by the time we cleared the causeway, where the day's incoming produce and shoppers all funneled toward Freetown, we were out of range of all but the strongest of crossbows, assuming any were ready and in place for the guard tower parapets. The clippity clop of Garlock's hooves chained to the muted drumming as he carried me along the packed clay of the highway. No stones or highways in Freetown, it seemed. We galloped past a crossroads, which carried more traffic than the road we traveled, and kept heading into Kandar. 
for too long, I reined in Garawak, keeping in the middle of the road, which was surprisingly firm, considering the continuing rain and dampness of the night before. Garawak dropped to a trot, then a walk. Good horse, I thwacked him on the shoulder. Careful not to touch the welt raised by the liveryman. Enough. I didn't like them much either. I glanced at the causeway and the dark spot that marked the gate. Nothing seemed to have happened. No other horses had followed us. The intermittent stream of people, horses, and wagons still headed up the stone pavement toward the city. Then I realized I was still holding the staff in my hand. The wood had cooled until it was no longer warm to my touch. Half of the leather thong I had used to tie the staff in place was missing. Ripped in two when I had grabbed for the staff to defend against the guard. I replaced the staff in the lance cup, tying it in place with the remaining leather. Looking for the staff to the road, my eyes fixed on the rectangular stone post by the road. Risbarg 40k, proclaimed the weathered stone. I had let go of Gerlock's mane and straightened up in the saddle. Chalking the reins lightly as we headed down the rise on the road to his bark. Already it had been more of a day than I had planned. Assaulted by a thief, attacked by the Duke's gate guard, and probably declared a criminal in Freetown all on the first day. I didn't know where I was going, except that I knew Hrisbarg was where. I had to go before I could get to the roads leading to East Horns and eventually to West Horns. Would Freetown guards spread the word, or would they take it out on the other danger gilders? Or had the others left while I had been hanging out with Circlus to get Gerlock? My guts wrenched a little, wondering if I could have left Freetown without causing so much of an uproar. I shrugged knowing I couldn't undo what I had done, but also knowing I might end up paying for it somehow, some way, when I really didn't want to. So Garlock and I started along the long walk to Hrisberg. Thrum, thrum. Above us, the clouds thickened and rumbled, promising more rain. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like, comment, and subscribe, and turn on notifications so you never miss out on any of these videos. See y'all in the next one. Goodbye!